Hi everybody, this is a new series that I'm going to be starting called Real Economics. In it, I'm going to be discussing the economic theories and models that have actual empirical evidence, and trashing the ones that don't. So to any learned scholars among you, that means I'm going to be talking about how neoclassical economics and Austrian economics and supply-side economics are all bullshit nonsense. Those theories of economics make alchemy and phlogiston look like contemporary chemistry by comparison. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the recent history of economics, defining what classical economics is, what neoclassical economics is, and how Karl Marx fits into this whole thing. Then we'll get to the basis for many of the theories of neoclassical economics, rationality. After we show that to be stupid and wrong, we'll go over in later episodes how supply and demand are lies and actually know better at explaining where prices come from than the labor theory of value that they supposedly replaced, and then some other fun stuff. Almost all of the information I'm presenting in this video was the result of Steve Keen, an academic economist with a PhD and all that, who started following me on Twitter. So before we get into what rationality is, I think it's important to describe why the model of rationality actually came about in the first place. To know that, you need to know why neoclassical economics came about, and to know that, you need to know what classical economics is. The earliest form of economics done by white people is called classical economics. There was other work done in the field of economics by non-white people centuries earlier though, such as the work summarized in the Discourses on Salt and Iron in China from 81 BC, in which it was determined over 2,000 years ago that laissez-faire economics, in Chinese wu wei, literally do nothing, is bullshit. Or the work of Abu Zaid Abd ar Abu Zayd Abd al-Rahman bin Muhammad bin Khaldun al-Hadramiyu or Ibn Khaldun, an Arab scholar born in Tunis in 1332, whose work bears a striking resemblance to the work of Adam Smith, who would come a few hundred years later. So anyway, classical economics is the work of people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. But what is classical economics? Well, it's a lot of things. These people wrote quite large and boring books, but for our purposes, the most important thing it did was make use of the labor theory of value. The various forms of the labor theory of value state that you can predict the average price of a good based on the amount of useful labor that went into making it. Turns out, though, that this is not a real good way of predicting prices. The first big critique of classical economics came from a guy called Karl Marx in a book called Das Kapital. It's for this reason that you can't ignore Marx or his work when learning economics. His ideas and models were either the basis for future theories, or what future theories were directly responding to, even if they didn't say it out loud. In Das Kapital, Marx actually uses the labor theory of value because it was the current state of the economic study at the time. Classical economics used the labor theory of value, and Marx's critique of classical economics used it as well. But nowadays, many people will even call it Marx's labor theory of value, and falsely believe that it's required for all of Marx's conclusions that he makes in Das Kapital, such as the exploitation of labor. This is of course wrong. You can show that even without the labor theory of value, that labor, workers, are exploited in capitalism. I mean, if you work for an hour making 10 shirts, and each shirt sells for $10, then the company is going to be bringing in 100 bucks. But you're not going to get paid 100 bucks. If you did, the company wouldn't turn a profit. Therefore, you're exploited. The company has to be exploiting you, that is, not paying you the true value of what you produced, because otherwise, they wouldn't be making money, and they wouldn't have hired you. The only production that gets done in capitalism is production in which someone can be reliably exploited. You know that vague feeling you get when you come home from work that you're being ripped off? It's because it's true. Anyway, to oversimplify, Marx's work showed the value in modeling societies as groups of people with common interests, and where different groups have interests that are at odds with other groups. This is Marx's class conflict. Classes are people who fall on one side of a society, and have conflicting interests with people who fall on the other side. Landlords and tenants, masters and slaves, bosses and workers. Each of these groups has interests that the group on the other side are opposed to. So, in response to classical economics, you get Marx's economics. Now, obviously, the classical economists of the time didn't really like that. Many of them were quite well off and looking mainly for a way of morally justifying their positions of immense wealth and power. The main way that they justified these divisions in society was through something called individualism. 
Individualism is not the same as individual liberty, by the way. Individualism is where you're told that you're an individual with complete control over your life. So whenever anything bad happens to you, you either blame yourself or someone else instead of the system. The system is fair after all. Everyone gets the lot that they worked for. I don't make enough money to feed my family. It must be because I'm lazy or because some immigrant stole my job. So people who have all the wealth and power, by definition according to individualism, have to deserve it. And you must deserve nothing, since it's what you got. This whole class-based analysis of the economy really rubbed these rich economists the wrong way. They always liked looking at society through the lens of individuals, because it made them more comfortable. But luckily, they got together, keeping their models of economics separate from their worldview and personality and identity, and the field of study moved forward towards a better understanding. Just kidding, they dug their heels in. And thus was born neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics came about as a response to classical economics' shortcomings regarding the labor theory of value and a strong, strong dislike for Marx's use of class conflict and the dialectic. I love the dialectic. All of the people who liked classical economics really liked all the philosophical undertone stuff about it, how rich people deserve their wealth, how the government shouldn't get involved, and all that. But the shortcomings of classical economics were becoming too big to ignore. So neoclassical economists said, hold on, don't get rid of all of our policy recommendations just because the fundamentals of our theory are nonsense. Look, we've come up with a way of arriving at the same conclusions and support for our ideology. They basically found a new way of saying the same thing that had been shown to be bullshit in the past. This new way was called marginalism. Marginalism says that you can effectively model the economy as being made up of individuals without having to get into class analysis and all that other… uncomfortable stuff. Everyone has their own personal preferences. Each person likes different things to different amounts. So the reason the labor theory of value can't reliably predict prices, they say, is because it doesn't take into account the personal preferences of every individual in the market. We'll talk about this in a future video on supply and demand. The formal definitions of all of this came out of a guy called Paul Samuelson, and by the end of the video you're going to wonder what end of him it came out of. Paul Samuelson said that humans can accurately be modeled as rational utility maximizers. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, utility maximizers are people who try to get the most happiness, or utility, when given a choice. So they will never choose the option of being paid a hundred bucks to eat thumbtacks if the option of just being paid a hundred bucks for standing there is also available. That's reasonable. Rational, though, is a bit more complicated. There are four axioms, axiom is a word academics use to mean rule, that define rational behavior. The first is completeness. Someone who is rational can rank every choice available to them. So if the choices are A and B, they either like A more than B, B more than A, or both the same amount. It's called completeness because there are no choices which the rational actor, as they are called, has no opinion on or can't put in a ranking. Second is transitivity. If you prefer A to B and B to C, then you also have to prefer A to C. Third, non-satiation. This is a fancy term that just means more is better. If one option has more of something, then it's preferred to one that has less, everything else being equal. Fourth is convexity. Each additional unit of something you get adds less happiness to your total happiness than the one before it. Economists call this diminishing marginal returns. Think about you getting $10,000 versus Jeff Bezos getting $10,000. That $10,000 is going to make you a lot happier than it is Jeff Bezos. So what neoclassical economists like to use all these axioms for is to construct something called indifference curves. An indifference curve is a list of all the combinations of things that you're indifferent between. You like all of these different combinations the same amount. If we plot the amount of one good on an x-axis and another one on a y-axis, the line that connects all the different combinations which you like equally well is an indifference curve. So imagine you have three pairs of shoes and six coats. If I took a shirt away from you, there is some amount of shoes that I could give you that would make you the same level of happy. You can also think of this in terms of trading Pokemon cards. If you would trade three of your EX Delta Species Series Holographic Vaporeon EX cards to get another Neo Revelation Holographic Houndoom, then both the set of cards that you started with and the set of cards that you ended with were on the same indifference curve for you. Okay, so all of these seem reasonable, and they are, but soon after Paul Samuelson published them in 1938, people started pointing out some flaws. 
most notable of them being that you can't actually observe indifference curves. This is a pretty big deal. You can't really base a science on something you can't possibly observe. Paul Samuelson publishes another work where he says, okay, I've heard all your complaints about how neoclassical economics isn't actually observable, but jokes on you, you can observe indifference curves. And here's how. He said that you can use something called revealed preferences to observe indifference curves. You give a bunch of people different combinations of goods to choose from. You vary the prices and how much that they can spend, and then you use that information to work backwards to get an indifference curve. So indifference curves are not actually unobservable. You just have to do a test. And Paul Samuelson and the rest of the neoclassical economists leaned back in their chairs, put their hands behind their head, and breathed a big sigh of relief. Their field of study was saved from its critics. So Samuelson basically said to do an experiment similar to our Pokemon trading card example from earlier, but instead of trading with other people, people would be given a set amount of money, called a budget constraint, because apparently the word budget isn't snobby enough, and then given a bunch of cards at different prices, and then they would be asked to buy what they felt was their best combination, then adjust the prices and have them do it again. What's the problem? Well, being able to actually test a theory by observation isn't the only step in the process. It's just the first one. The second step is to actually go out and test the theory with observation. Just being testable doesn't mean it's useful at explaining reality. There are many theories that are testable. You can test the theory that the sun revolves around the earth, but that doesn't mean that it's a useful way of describing the situation. So Paul Samuelson publishes his Revealed Preferences stuff in 1948, and it's not until 1997 that someone actually gets around to testing it. That's 49 years of treating an untested theory as gospel by neoclassical economists. But before we get to the test of rational actors in 1997, I'm going to address some other studies that tried to use Revealed Preferences to test the theory of rational utility maximizers that you may either know of or hear brought up. The first three used surveys sent to members of the public. The problem here is that they aren't actually testing individuals' rationality, but instead the entire market. Also, preferences change over time, which the surveys couldn't capture. Another fun one was where researchers set up a shop in a mental hospital and gave the patients tokens to buy things with. They then varied the prices and observed how their buying habits changed. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't expect people getting treatment in a mental hospital to be acting what an economist would call rationally. And lastly, there was a study done on rats. So it's upon these rocks and nothing else that the Church of Rational Utility Maximizers was built. And most of those studies, by the way, found very poor evidence for the theory of rational utility maximizers anyway. So what set the 1997 study apart from the rest? So this German guy named Reinhard Sippel, I'm pronouncing his name wrong probably, gets some university students and performs the first true test of whether the model of rational utility maximization accurately describes human behavior. The students, instead of picking Pokemon cards, chose the amount of eight different goods. They were able to actually consume the goods immediately after the test and were given as much time as they wanted to decide on their choice. The prices of the combinations they made were calculated automatically by a computer, so the students didn't have to worry about totaling up the cost of their combination themselves. They would just be given a budget, told the prices of the goods, and they could spend as much time as they wanted to get their perfect combination, with the computer telling them how much they had spent and had left all along the way. Then the prices were changed, and they did it all over again. They were also paid to be part of the study. Sippel is quoted with saying, There can be no doubt that the students tried to select a combination of goods that came as close as possible to what they really liked to consume, given the respective budget constraints. They spent a considerable amount of time in their decisions, typically 30 to 40 minutes, and repeatedly corrected their entries when they reconsidered previous choices. Originally, he did the test with a small number of students, but later expanded to a larger sample, one big enough to apply the central limit theorem. We're not going to get into it now. So what did Sippel find? Well, he found that the vast majority of students behaved irrationally, violating the weak axiom of revealed preference and the strong axiom of revealed preference. The weak axiom says that if you prefer A to B, you should never prefer B to A. The strong axiom is the transitivity one. If A is preferred to B and B is preferred to C, then A is preferred to C. So these were university students studying economics, 
It's not a sample of the general population, but that's okay. We would expect the results of this student population to be skewed in favor of the theory of rational utility maximizers, since one, they were smart enough to get into college, and two, they were familiar with economics. But they weren't rational. So how serious were these violations of rationality? Simple thought that maybe human minds are just not entirely precise. You can relax the assumptions of rationality somewhat. Think of taking the line of an indifference curve and making it a bit thicker. Yeah, you might not like these two combinations exactly the same, but we'll call it close enough. When Sippel reduced the rationality constraint from 1 to 0.95, he found out that the students actually were rational. So that's good. But here's what sets Sippel apart from the rest. He then generated random choices and saw how those performed. He found that at the same level of rational constraint, 0.95, randomness was rational as well. And further, when he reduced the constraint of rationality from 0.95 to 0.9 and lower, randomness was actually more rational than university students. So Samuelson's model of rational behavior is better at describing choices made by rolling a die than the behavior of actual human beings. Another kicker of Sippel's paper is that it's obvious that something aside from randomness is going on with how humans make decisions, but it sure as hell isn't rational utility maximization. So then, what is it? Well, luckily, there is an entire field of research with a long history of running empirical tests to find out. It's called psychology. Yeah, every neoclassical economist thinks that some white guys from a hundred years ago knew more about the human psyche than everyone in the modern field of psychology does. Someone who deals with computers may have been able to find problems with the theory of rational utility maximizers just by looking at the four axioms. Not me, of course, but, you know, someone smarter. Specifically, the axiom of completeness. That's the first one that says that you can order every combination of things. Let's look at the typical grocery store in the US. It sells, on average, 31,119 different products. Let's simplify that to be 100 different product categories. So we're going to group all the cereals together into one category called cereal. We'll also simplify it even further by saying that consumers don't even consider how much of something to buy, just whether to buy it or not. So how many total combinations possible are there? Well, it's 2 to the 100. Some of you may already be seeing the problem here, but let's continue anyway. So quicksort is an algorithm that computers use to sort lists of things into order. Assume that you have a processor that takes one second to sort a million combinations of goods. Well, the time it takes quicksort, on average, to sort a list is proportional to n times the base 10 log of n. So in English, that means that if it takes one second to sort a million things, it's going to take 200 quadrillion years to sort enough combinations for you to do a very, very dumbed down version of your grocery shopping. This is why all the textbooks and examples you get in econ classes only ever use two goods. If they started giving examples with more than just two goods, you would realize how bullshit this model is. You'd be sitting at your desk in a lecture hall during your econ exam, taking 30 minutes or more to figure out with a pencil and paper the best bundle of things for this imaginary consumer to buy with $20, when it takes you and everyone else in the classroom 30 seconds at the checkout line. So neoclassical economics' rational utility maximizer theory is pretty much dead in the water. It doesn't make sense from a computation standpoint, theoretically. It was created to revitalize already problematic models to avoid the adherence of those models having to reassess their worldview. For the majority of its life, it was untested, and in the first real test it had, it was shown to be a better model of random noise than actual human behavior. Unfortunately for us, none of this stopped neoclassical economists from building the rest of their models on top of it. So next episode, we're going to talk about supply and demand, which in neoclassical econ are built on top of rationality.